question is key success factors to commercializing your technology solutions with Gary Wetzel. We'd like to thank our sponsors, Chase, Downtown Dallas, Vela Wood, Touch Titans, Dev Mountain, Circus, Kratos, and many more. And a special thanks to Chase for providing the location for this session. And here's Gary Wetzel. Thank you, Zach. Thanks to all of you for being here. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be with you and have you be here. And it's never easy to be placed on Friday afternoon after lunch and shortly before happy hour. But uh, with that said, I uh, hope to make it worth your time for sitting here and uh, provide you some useful information before you go today. Uh, also, hats off to DS, uh, DSW, as you mentioned. Uh, when I look at the agenda over the last couple of days, I will say that I'm impressed by the diversity of businesses and ventures and tracks that the program has. It's probably my own bias, but uh, when I think of startups and startup week, I immediately go to technology-based companies and maybe commercial product companies. But when I see art and travel and healthcare and fashion, I will say it's pretty impressive. And uh, hats off to DSW for putting the program together like that. And uh, I guess it could be said that when we look at all these companies, no matter what vertical they're in, they are all powered in some way by technology. It's not a new insight, really. Um, and we can then say that on some level, they actually are technology companies in one way with their technology function being at the core of what they do. But I, uh, I want to say that I think that there's a trap in that thinking, this idea that um, technology is at the center of a business. And uh, I've been known to say that no matter what part of a business that you're in, there's a way to rationalize that your part of the business is the part that drives the, to the, the whole company. And it goes something like this. The sales guys say, if I didn't sell it, you wouldn't have anything to make. And the marketing person says, if I didn't market it, the customer would have never known about it. And the operations guy, where I come from an operations background, would say, yeah, but I make it and I ship it. And even finance gets in the game. I'm a finance guy, too. It says, if I wasn't raising money for you guys and uh, wasn't collecting money, then we wouldn't be able to pay for their salaries and operations. So I do make this argument that um, and I usually have fun with it, that a lot of, no matter where you stand in a company, there's a way to rationalize that you are the essential engine of the company. And I start here because in a technology company, and particularly a company that is a technology product or service itself, there's a double uh, challenge there, or orientation toward thinking that technology is, quote unquote, the heart and soul of the company. And I do believe that there's a trap in that. And I start with that because this session is in the technology and development track of this multi-track program. And we're going to talk about commercializing a technology product or service. And it's hard not to start with this awareness, but I, uh, with this perspective that technology is at the heart of this. And much while I will talk directly about commercializing technology and the things you can do with respect to technology to help that, uh, I'm also going to touch about talk about the critical success factors that are tangential to technology uh, that relate to commercializing the technology itself. Um, so by way of brief introduction, just uh, I am CEO and co-founder of Form.io. Form.io is, in fact, a software technology company. And we are a tool for developers. We are the first combined form and API platform that enables software application developers to build applications and form-based applications and deploy them within their applications, distributed across the internet, and tie them automatically into the data management infrastructures that they serve or that they draw upon. And we do so uh, with some significant innovations. And as such, uh, we save them time and money. What's interesting about that is that because of that model, we serve developers that operate in just about every end user business vertical out there, be it healthcare or education or government or travel, or industrial manufacturing, online learning, education. It's uh, the same model, uh, developers building applications in this new world of Web 3.0 with distributed interfaces. Um, and as such, we have a pretty uh, broad based opportunity on the front end. And equivalently, we serve developers that aren't uh, 
isolated to one developer community either. Uh, Drupal developers, Angular JS, uh, JS uh, React JS uh, programmers, and uh, and a number of other legacy uh, uh, software platforms, CMS platform tie-ins, be it uh, Info uh, SharePoint or, or the like. And as such, we have a very powerful opportunity ahead of us. And you'd think that it would be reasonably easy to start out with that. Um, but in fact, that in of itself has presented us some challenges that I want to share with you. Um, with that said, a matter of timeline, we just passed our first anniversary last month, which is a little bit of a milestone for us. And uh, we were founded in the first quarter of last year. We assembled a small team. We built the product. We conducted a beta program throughout the summer months with about 200 developers. And then we launched at an industry event, in this case, uh, TechCrunch Disrupt in San Francisco. And since that time, by the end of the year, we were able to engender a fair amount of uh, industry awareness and attract attraction and some early adopters and early revenue. So since that time in the Q1, that train has continued to move down the road. And as we sit here, we have user accounts building, uh, site traffic building, uh, applications being built and uh, revenue generating customers. So we're in, in a number of different ver verticals. So in that sense, we're out of the starting gates. But I will tell you that in the context of commercializing our platform, we're really still very much at the beginning. And uh, so maybe there's some instructive sharing of what's happened to us in the first year that I can uh, include in my commentary that, that I hope is helpful to you guys. Um, to do so, I want to use the framework of the investor presentations. And I want to start about with investor presentations because if any of you are in fact in the process of or contemplating commercializing a technology service or product, you will undoubtedly be involved with investor presentations. Many of you have been and if you have been, you'll continue to be as I am and have been as well. And so we're all pretty familiar with them. Um, I'm here to start by saying that investor presentations are a major pain in the butt for everybody. There isn't anybody that likes them. They're challenging, they're arduous, they require you to distill a ton of information about your business and your vision and your market and your competitors all into one, uh, one uh, single event. You need to fit it into a very tight uh, period of time. There's a certain amount of the feeling of either judgment or evaluation or critique along the way. There's a line of people in front of you and behind you and nobody really enjoys the process. And I'd go as far to say that the investors don't enjoy the process either. Um, but it's, I start there because it's an inherent part of the commercialization of, your, of your, the, the fundraising side of the equation is a central part of raising money for your business. And the investor presentation is a central mechanism to do that. And I'm gonna put forth the following argument. It's the exact things that you don't like about your investor presentation that are the key to the success of your commer com commercializing your product. They're in fact one and the same. Everything that causes you to be disrupted and bothered and frictioned about the investor presentation is the exact same thing about uh, identifying the key success factors of your business. And it's not that much of a surprise really because the investor presentation is about evaluating your prospects for success in doing what? commercializing your product. And the last thing your investor presentation is about is about your product itself. So I want to use that as a framework and go through that as a mechanism to talk about some of the things that we've done in the first year of our business, but also use it as a mechanism to talk about the key uh, success items for commercializing, creating a business around a technology and then commercializing it. With that said, I'll say that as goes the present, uh, investor presentation, so goes the commercialization of your product. Before I get there, I want a little sidebar. And normally at the start of commercializing your product, you hear a lot about seed investments. I thought I knew what a seed was when I started the process a year ago. I thought it was that. A little thing you put in the ground and you water for a little while and you wait. And it then after that period of time grows into something. Well, little did I know that everything's bigger in Texas and I'm, I have come to learn that there's no such thing as a seed in Texas. And in fact, that is a seed in Texas. It's my argument, it's my experience that for technology companies and software companies, a seed is defined by a small bushy plant with leaves on it. So with that digression, let's look at the, uh, the, uh, the investor presentation 
and start at the top. At the beginning of the presentation, rule number one for successful investor presentation is to not start by talking about your product. That's an obvious thing. Investors want to know about your team. You all know it already. It's not new news to you. They want to know about you, about why you're doing what you're doing, and they'll actually take concern if you start out by talking about your product. In our case, uh, and the reason for that is that the team matters. In our case, just to share it with you, we were favored with the fact that we have three co-founders. And we were favored with the fact that we have a very shared balance of competencies from technology, finance and operations, organizational, and sales and marketing. And I'd put forth that before you worry about commercializing the technology itself, I would take this as a challenge in your investor presentation that is also a challenge for your commercialization of your product, which is making sure that you have the team in place to do so. So you think of commercializing a product, more important than that and in front of that is identifying and answering the question, do you have the team to commercialize the product, irrespective of how good the product is? And if you, you need to start there. Um, so the team is more important of it uh, than the product itself. You can't do it alone. And uh, you need a team that knows your market and knows your customers. And I would say that I'm favored with the fact that we have a team that does. Uh, I, I can tell you we wouldn't be sitting here otherwise today um, because a lot of the learnings that we went through in the first year uh, related to um, solidifying an already pretty solid understanding of the market. But we had a lot of learning to do, even with that head start. And without that knowledge of the market, and without having a team, uh, the balanced team amongst even the three co-founders, in addition to the team that we built, uh, was a critical element of getting through the challenge of developing the product and commercializing it. So the, the commercialization analog to the team and the investor is, don't worry about con uh, commercializing the product until you first address your team. The second point is one I've already mentioned. It's not about the product. And this is not new news to most of you anyway, is not to talk about your product in an investor presentation. What's more subtle is how that relates to commercializing your product. I'm convinced that I know that I did it, and I would say this is probably the biggest mistake that we made as a company. We sucked it up in the investor presentation and talked about the management team and about the problems we solved, and as soon as those were done, we operated and thought and spoke and messaged about our product. We did the exact opposite of what we did in that investor presentation. And probably the biggest mistake we made, the biggest challenge we faced, was learning, even though we could see ourselves doing it, was learning how to not focus on our product itself and everything we thought and everything we did surrounding trying to commercialize it. Because it's not about the product as much as it's about the product, that, the, the problem that you're solving. And that's easy to see in the investor analog side of the equation and less obvious in commercializing your product. So key requirement number two is that in Form IO's case, we learned to focus not on the capabilities of what we do, which we could talk about at length, but we focus on the driver of our opportunity, which in our case was this chasm, this paradigm shift in the way applications are being developed. And so all of our activities now surround the existence of this underlying truth, this basic tenet of our entire business model, irrespective of our product, that drives the commercialization of it is related to the chasm that exists between Web 2.0 and Web 3.0 that is driving the need for our products and services. And I would say that that's easy to get in a presentation and less obvious to get in the context of a commercialization plan. So point number two is not to be too product-centric. It's easy to say. It's incredibly hard to do in my view, and especially for the starting point of this, which is a technology company that started with a technology founder that believes that they're a technology company because they want to talk about the technology. So those two things hand in hand are the first uh, two uh, points for success in commercializing your product. The third one is also fairly obvious in the context of an investment uh, environment or uh, in presentation, and less so in commercialization, is knowing your customers and knowing their pain points and knowing their economics and knowing them better. Uh, I would say that in our case, we, um, I think I have a slide up there. We knew what we wanted to do. We knew who our customers were. We knew that they would love our products. I would tell you that 100% of the time when we were able to get in front of a customer and tell them what we did, 
our value proposition resonated wholly with them and was compelling to them. And 100% of the time, when we didn't have that opportunity, we did not resonate our customer base with our value proposition. And so the biggest challenge for us was to find that way to take something that we executed on so easily in person and couldn't execute on uh, as easily when we didn't have that face-to-face -face contact. Um, and that relates to having the ability to speak in your customer's terms and really do so. And that is, again, academically quite obvious, but uh, easier said than done. In our case, uh, we uh, knew who our customers were, we knew how to go find them, and we didn't, because of that, what I mentioned, which is the great strength of what we do, so many different verticals and so many different use cases, it made it hard for us to distill down in any one way exactly why any one of them should see us the way they should, because they were for different uh, uh, use cases and different value propositions. So, you know in an investor presentation, you're not going anywhere unless you have very well-defined customers. I would say in commercializing your product for a startup, you need a targeted, well-defined customer base with a well-defined funnel that I drew there uh, on the back side of that. Next obvious stepping uh, is you're gonna go after these customers. Most of us aren't the first ones to have been there. There's a competitive playing field and we all know it. Uh, I would say in our case, we had a, a very strong, Denise, if you would change that for me. Uh, you know, a very strong, uh, the benefit of a very well-defined uh, starting point. We were wedged right between two very distinctly defined communities. There were form players that didn't participate in the API side of the equation, and there were API players that never thought about being up in the application side of the business and we were wedged right between them. And, but what happened that was interesting enough for us is that we found from our customers that we had the need to be able to articulate our customers' value propositions and their operations and their solutions as well as we could articulate our own and as though we actually worked for them. It wasn't okay for us to be able to just say we're different and who the, these are who the other guys are. It's easy to show that in an investor presentation and say, I get it. But when you translate this to the outside of the investor presentation to your commercialization challenge, it's much less obvious of how you embrace and how you communicate and how you articulate your, your um, separation from your competitor's value proposition. So uh, point number four is to define your competitive playing field, not only for your presentation, but also especially early on in the business to focus your resources and focus your activities and your dollars on uh, uh, achieving a, a, a very specific competitive uh, roadmap. So we move on to success f uh, factor number five, which is, again, easily to see in the investor presentation, is the idea of being able to articulate how you make money. I will tell you it's surprising to me how many presentations I've seen that don't spend a lot of time on how you make money. And if you take it in the context of that the point of that presentation is about commercializing a business, you need to have some discussion that uh, talks about generating money. As that is very hard to do sometimes with a limited period of time with technology products because you want to talk about that damn product. And it's actually the last thing somebody wants to talk about. So your revenue model in a presentation is easy to see. In our case, um, we are, are a software as a service, or better state of the platform as a service, and uh, we structured our, 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 our service and our platform as a freemium model, which means that our customers can try it for free and they can then upgrade as they want additional volume and features, and it allows them to march down the road. And in our case, it's based, it's a re recurring revenue based on a per app basis and based on utilization of the platform itself. What's relevant here is not only to pick the price points, but to structure the mechanisms and the triggers of your revenue generating model to be consistent with who you're interfacing with and with your customers. So for us, I will say, more of the challenge regarding the revenue model was having our revenue 
mechanisms be consistent with the other players that we were tying our, our horse to, that we were working with, so that we didn't, weren't discontinuous with the ways that our customers were paying for those services as well. It, was only, it wasn't only about price level, but it's also about uh, having a pricing strategy that allows adoption and allows uh, your customers and your partners to embrace your model. So uh, clearly, understanding uh, your customer's economic value proposition for your product and service is at the heart and soul of commercializing your product. Um, but what's less obvious is structuring it in a way that allows the market to adopt it. The next thing that's uh, relevant, probably as much uh, really uh, in a technology company uh, today with the ever-increasing connectivity and integration between all the players. We're not in a silo anymore. Very few solutions exist or can be adopted by customers without having the answers to how you tie into not only legacy systems, the easy part of the equation to discuss or see, but to the other investments that that company is making, whether it's existing platform service or new ones that are being uh, invested in alongside of yours. So how you go to market on an integrated basis with other players is a key part of it. In our case, on the front end, we decided to go to market in part directly, as you'll see up there, direct sales to end user users in, in different uh, business verticals. But for every one of those, we have another customer that is a platform subject matter expert within those verticals who then integrates our product and sells it to a number of their customers, not ours. And that's relevant because as you think of, obviously, uh, how to commercialize your product and to select your technology platform and configure how you deploy what you have, uh, that gets complicated pretty quick if you haven't uh, thought about that in advance. And equivalently, on the supply side, and this is really uh, as or even more important for us, is the ability to design your product contemplating the integration the ability to integrate with large communities of developers on the supply side, whether they're leveraging applications from HubSpot or Dropbox or Microsoft Office 365 or any other Microsoft products, um, or integrating with email solutions or the like. The ever-emerging world of fragmented microservices requires you to configure your product platform in a way that enables you to commercialize it in the context of integrating with everyone else. There's no such thing now as having an isolated solution for most, for most, uh, certainly for technology businesses, that doesn't have a ready answer for integration. And in our world, being an API platform, we anchor to the fact, think API connectivity first. In fact, there's a language out there now, there's a commentary of think, well, we used to say think mobile first, uh, today, people uh, from a development perspective say think API first to make sure that you're prepared for exactly that image right there from a uh, design and architecture perspective. So from a commercialization port, uh, uh, to drive go to market, you, clearly how you select and configure your platform is relevant to uh, enable what I consider to be a basic tenet of what will be your commercialization plan, which is the ability to integrate with um, partners, third-party players, customers themselves, um, and in some cases, even competitors. And the net, getting near the end of these, uh, on these uh, investor-related items is planning for growth. Um, when we look at this and we try to take that small plant that I showed earlier and, and allow it to grow, uh, getting out of the starting gates, and as we have, we've gotten out of the starting gates, we have a pretty positive story. But as much of our effort uh, today is about ensuring that we have in place the scalability and the mechanisms and the commercialization plans to, to allow the company to grow uh, quickly and exponentially. And to do that, you need to have a plan that is articulated as it would be in an investor plan uh, that, that considers and contemplates the channel partners that you're going to go through, the customer segments one by one that you're going to serve, and the continuing product features up the vertical axis that you're going to build. 
In our case, what we've learned here is that we, I can tell you, if we came to one definition of MP, v, MVP, we came to five definitions of MVP. We had one, an early MVP, and then we kind of came into another tier of customers, and we had another definition of MVP, another definition of MVP, and as you grow, you kind of live that world. And essentially, we were marching down the road, not only of the next MVP level of feature functionality, but allowing us to serve additional channel partner communities and uh, serve different customer uh, market segments. So in terms of commercializing your technology and commercializing your product, planning for that fact that you don't just get there one day and sell what you have really ever uh, is a very central part of succeeding at the commercialization plan overall and supporting the growth that you'll need. And clearly, selecting your technology platform to do that is uh, a big part of that. So when I think of the remaining items that are less obviously in the construct of investment uh, uh, presentations, when I think of commercialization of uh, a commercializing a product and technology, building a business around it, after you've put the plan in place, after you know your markets, after you know your competition, after you've built the product, there are all these remaining issues. Um, scaling on top of third-party systems. In our case, we have the luxury, as what's enabled and reduced the fixed cost of starting a technology business, is leveraging off of a uh, infrastructure like AWS. So we run our platform on AWS. We could really run it on anybody's cloud environment. But in either case, from our perspective, we can scale quite freely and quite efficiently just like anyone else can, but it, it's because we're structured that way. So scalability is something that we um, had very early on in our planning before we even worried about customers or pricing. Utilizing third-party data security. If there's an issue on the table today that we, I don't think I've really ever talked to a customer that uh, didn't have very high on their list concerns about data uh, access and data security. Um, and there's a number of ways to uh, utilize third-party uh, solutions and, and workflows to address the data security issue without taking on the burden of being the one to say, I myself have built all these data security infrastructure capabilities because that can become a sidebar uh, cost side issue all by itself. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, integrating with uh, microservices more and more in our world as an example, uh, many of, we have a very, in, in Fort Myo's case, the vast majority of the things that we tie into are things that we don't do ourselves. The value propositions that we provide our customers, the ability to build these applications, but what they really also want to get at are the ability to tie into third-party services. And we just continue to build a larger and larger array of what those services are, and they allow you to scale on the integrated capabilities of those third-party uh, solutions rather than having to build themselves. The second to last one is something that's emerged for me as being, uh, I think, probably one of the biggest uh, risks, but also biggest opportunities in our business and in any business that I see. The world is moving fast. And the uh, even within the platforms that we're built on, those platforms are evolving quickly. And other solutions are moving quickly. We were born on the cloud. We were born on the other side of the chasm. We have significant competitive advantages because we were built on the next gen platforms and tools that are less encumbering and fixed than just three or four years ago on the other side of that same chasm. That sounds good and feels good, and it is good, but that train continues to move quickly. And I think of something, when I think of a commercialization of a, a technology uh, product and platform, uh, this has to be front and center, is to know that no matter where you stand, you better keep on running. And you better be positioned to run because everyone's running around you. And so where we are today is not likely where we'll be in a short period of time. And that's a very intrinsic part of our commercialization plan rather than just feeling so positive about where we are in any given moment. And last uh, questions will come up in a quick second, no problem, just last, get, get very close to the end anyway. But open source versus uh, proprietary solutions. Uh, in our case, I would say uh, we are an open source platform. There isn't one definition of what that means for companies. We are a company who's fully committed to a robust open source solution and a robust open source presence and capability in the future. And 
with that statement being made, that has been a very intrinsic part of our go-to-market plan. It's enabled us to participate in communities and draw cooperation and participation and partnership with enterprises that we would not be able to if we didn't have that underlying philosophy. We happen to subscribe to it anyway. It's enabling of a community of developers to contribute to our product and improve it on top of our product, but also is a big part, I think of it as being a big part of our business plan and our commercial commercialization plan. And so those are the remaining factors that I think of that are more technology related in terms of identifying the tools that you deploy. But in truth, when we look at commercializing a technology product, I would say in quick summary, look at that investor deck process. Look at all the reasons why you don't like going through it, because it feels like you're doing things that are taking your mind off of your product itself. And taking your mind off of the technology is what you want to talk about. And in reality, the success of your commercialization plan is in those activities. And uh, with that, if you succeed at that, we'll all look like this on the back end of our commercial plan. Anyway, thank you for the time, and uh, certainly uh, would have, be happy to answer any questions if you have them. Yes, yes, and uncomfortably so, I would say. I, uh, I have a, a, a CTO, favorably, who is, uh, has a strong presence not only in the Drupal community, but also in the open source community, and uh, is, is a co-founder and partner of our business, along with uh, Denise Kay here, our third co-founder on the sales and business side. And um, favorably, he had a, a, a very strong philosophy surrounding open source and knew the promise of it. Um, what, what comes with that is the risk of it, the feeling of exposure. Um, it's a very uh, um, uh, unobvious way to, to think about protecting your business. Um, I personally have always believed in the absence of significant competitive advantage, even if you feel like you have it. Um, and I do believe you have to keep on running faster than the next guy. So we, um, we take pride in the fact that we share the core of what we do. We have a proprietary modules that we have additional services that people pay us for because they're not in the business of building applications themselves. Um, but we're very comfortable being uh, sharing our solutions to engender widespread operations. And we believe that absent that, you don't really have the opportunity to uh, shoot for being an industry standard, to plan to be widespread, ado widely adopted. And it's a, that, that's a very central tenet of where we want to be. And we're seeing that already, but it wouldn't even really be a, a realistic vision if we weren't enabling the development community to have full transparency, access, visibility, not only to the data of their applications, but to the code itself. And it's a significant source of differentiation for us in some cases. So for us, as I mentioned, interestingly enough, uh, easily stated resources an hour in the day is an easy one, um, but is not really getting at the heart of what you mentioned. I, I will say for us, there was way out in first place was our ability to message what it is that we do. Um, combined form and API platform, what the heck is that? Why does it matter? Um, why is it compelling to me? And every time we talk, get in front of someone in our case, and are able to talk about what you can do with it, um, invariably, the hook is set. Just before that, it is never set. So our challenge due to the complexity of what we uh, do has been wholly related to uh, communicating our value proposition and how customers should see it impacting their business. Please, of course. Yeah, yeah, we did both, and in fact, yeah, we did. We invested on some level, and small level, really, in trying to get third-party uh, outside sources to, that had some competencies in this area to help us, and I would say in relative terms, that was unfruitful. Um, what happened, what we then did, once the opportunity became more available to us, we listened to our customers. We would get on the phone and say, what does that guy see in what we are? What did he say? 
hey, call him back or call her back and ask her, what did she say? What does she see in us? And we began to begin to be, we knew what we could do and we knew what we did. We knew what the product was. Um, but we began to see their words more than our, and hear their words more than our own. So it's not surprising that we learned to speak our customer's language from our customers. And we did that quite intentfully. And I would say that to the degree that any of you have the opportunity to do it, we were told to do it early on. We didn't have the bandwidth or the access or the, truthfully, the early on feeling that we had to. Um, to we did the beta program, um, and that helped. But it wasn't until we really got that feedback from customers with early applications that we began to distill um, uh, an articulation in their words versus ours as to why they should care. Sounds easy, but it was very hard for us. Sir? Yes, uh, seeing is believing. So we, we typically, what we try to do is do a quick demo to facilitate the conversation. And I always say, Denise is better at this than, certainly than I am and better than anyone else in the company is. Uh, and then start listening really carefully. And so uh, I would say directionally, it's very important to be able to tell yourself that you have the mechanisms in place to listen really carefully and ask. And I will say, a technology mindset with a good product is not set up to start there. It is just not set. And that's why I started at the beginning about technology. When you think you're the engine of the company, you're not. And it takes a while to get there and for everybody. And uh, it's particularly hard when you feel so strongly about your product. Yeah, so they both, uh, the, yeah, the, thank you. the question uh, was that we have some early, it's interesting, he saw it, we have some early uh, um, traction in revenue with enterprise customers and with, so let's call it end user consumer customers, and which one do we see uh, being more difficult to grow? Um, so I, I, first of all, a majority of our customers, we grew into the fact that our solution was a robust, differentially capable enterprise solution. Uh, capable of taking on Fortune 500 companies, which we have done. Um, when you start out there, you don't really start there. You think, what if I get a bunch of a lot of the smaller end user, one-off customers, that'll be more rational. Um, truly, our business customers were enterprise customers were the ones that came to us quickly. Growth will happen through those channels for sure, but we by no means have de-emphasized our objective to become the industry standard for individual developers to build their applications on a one-off basis. And our strong belief is that our real growth is there. So both will continue to be the case. It's rational to me from a business perspective that the early on um, successes have been with enterprises, mid-sized enterprises and small businesses. Uh, but our capacities for growth really come from participating in those large developer and our value proposition comes from configuring our product for individual developers to take to work and deploy for one-off applications on a broad-based basis. Sir. Yeah, I really, uh, so my, ex my short answer to that would be absolutely not an NDA, uh, well, mostly because you'll rule out 90% of the audience, they won't do it. They won't allow you to put confidential on your deck. Um, they're not, in, I think what you have to be comfortable with is they're not in your business. And you may, there may be a case where you have to be at least aware or concerned if you're pitching to a venture capital company that has existing investments that compete directly with what you're doing. Maybe in that case. Absent that case, I really genuinely believe it's an unfounded concern. I think they're in the business of investing in businesses, and you're in the business of building your business. And um, it's a legitimate concern. It always, I remember being equally as cautious when I first st started. And in our case, I will tell you, we started out, 4MIO is what we are. 
We're the IO of forms. So before we came out, even though we had that name, we did not come out with Form IO. Our first investor decks had our parent company, uh, Open Tech Solutions, which is us as well. And we did that in part for your concern. So I want to share with you that it's a legitimate concern, but not really with the venture capital community at all. Investors are there. They're, they're respectful. They're trustworthy in that sense. Um, they might pass it around to someone they know in the technology community and say, hey, give me a feedback on this. That will happen. You need to be prepared for that happen. But uh, from a competitive perspective, you need to be prepared to run forward and compete anyway and move forward anyway. And that's not going to be the group that's going to get you. I, I believe that genuinely. Yes. It, it is what it means. And in, in fact, you know, coopetition, I didn't come up with that word. There's, there's a book on coopetition, if you've ever seen it. And it's even a little bit of a dated of a concept. But if it's ever really begun to continue to show up right now, it's in software technology solutions. Because you can't, so an example of that to your concern is, we integrate freely with Microsoft and have shared all of our information with Microsoft and uh, with IBM and with suppliers. And any one of them, you could squint at it and say, they might actually take what we just suggested that we do and do it themselves. And coopetition says, don't be afraid to, to, in our case, to create the integrations that allow our customers to use us and some portion of our competitors. And to do that, you just have to feel confident that your solution is compelling and differentiated and will continue to be. So I always say, we're going to run faster than the other guy. Open source, in some level, gives the other guy a head start to catch up with you in theory. But I, the, my counter to that is, that just gives them where you are on the track. You're still running faster than them. And so if they're not able to outperform you, then it doesn't matter, even if they get some of your capabilities, not all of them. And so competitive threat is like competitive advantage. I believe you have to just live in that world and, uh, and be comfortable with it. Yes, sir. I would absolutely still take that approach. I would with venture capital and other financing sources on the premise that there's risk in theory there. But again, they understand that risk. And they don't wake up trying to go, oh my gosh, I just got this great idea. Let's go fund some other guy. Um, I, would, I would certainly support, and have been even in our own history, highly protective of that information from a business planning perspective with the market at, at large. Right. Yep. Yep. I think you, in my case, we absolutely do a demo and show them something that's as akin to what we think as possible and don't have the premise on the conversation that what we're showing them is what they need and say almost exactly what you said. Because very often we don't know them well enough yet to know what they need and they don't know us well enough to bother telling us what they think they need. And then there's this third dynamic that says, your demo will provoke some visions. It's happened to us. Your demo provokes some visions in them about what they could think they need. That happens to us all the time in our case. 
So I believe strongly that sort of seeing is believing, um, but it's uh, idea generation comes out of it. Um, you need to forge that dialogue, but clearly you do so without this tone that says, let me show you what you need. And in fact, even if you have a really capable product, probably the biggest put off for a customer is hearing a little bit too much of this is what you need. And that's that listening comment that I mentioned earlier. It's very hard to do. Not everybody's up for it. You know, it will be. It's not, I just posted it. So uh, I'll have to go through DS. I'll be giving that to, I, I presume the DSW tracks will, I'll be giving it to them and they'll be putting it where they put everything else. But I will certainly have it there. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Yep. I totally believe that. The only thing I credit is that sense of fear um, because I've lived it as well. And you just have to come to the truth in what was just said there. And it's, it's objectively, it's very easy to see that as being true. When you're close to it, there's just no way you don't feel like you've got the thing that everybody's going to want. And it's not their business. Young lady. I don't perceive that that would be easy at all. On some level, you almost can't because some portion of your open source would be out there. Um, companies do it um, depending on their licensing. We, I mean, there are licenses that, that will actually allow a company to convert over. Um, and it, by the way, in our business has happened and there's companies that have a lot of difficulty right now as a result of that transition. Um, in our case, our licensing is, this is where the rubber meets the road is you end up, uh, really having to uh, decide whether you're going to be committed to open source. If you are committed to it, it's hard to unwind it. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for the questions.